Good morning, everybody. Um, as Becky said, it's Tuesday, May 5th, um, and we're going to be talking um, about a dinosaur today, um, one of the lesser known dinosaurs, um, a dinosaur that we do have here in North Dakota, um, and a dinosaur that has some really interesting features that I'm hoping that you'll all agree uh, makes it a, a worthy dinosaur to know. For me, it's, it's one of my favorite dinosaurs, but I understand if it's not everyone's favorite dinosaur. <clears throat> Becky. Um, but <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about a dinosaur called Thesplosaurus. So <clears throat> Thesplosaurus is a dinosaur that lived in the Hell Creek Formation, which is the very end of the age of dinosaurs here in North Dakota and also other states nearby, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, up into Canada. But when most people think about the end of the age of dinosaurs, uh, the Hell Creek Formation, the animals that they're usually thinking about are uh, the horned dinosaur, Triceratops, uh, the duck-billed dinosaur, Edmontosaurus, or our big uh, dominant carnivore, Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and a lot of the other dinosaurs, which is actually a lot of dinosaurs in the Hell Creek Formation, a lot of the other dinosaurs get ignored or forgotten or talked about now and then. Um, but the dinosaur that I'm talking about today, Thesplosaurus, after Triceratops and Edmontosaurus is the third most common um, smaller, more plant-eating like dinosaur in the Hell Creek Formation. And it's been suggested based on how often we find fragmentary material that it may have been one of the most common um, animals out there in the Hell Creek Formation. So it's a good dinosaur to know. So um, I'm going to start out walking you through the history of this animal and then we'll move into talking more specifics about what this animal looked like, what it ate, who it was related to, things like that. So our story today starts out with a paleontologist by the name of John Bell Hatcher, uh, this handsome looking gentleman here on the screen. Um, John Bell Hatcher was a paleontologist um, back in the 1800s and then in, into the early 1900s. And he did some of his own research as well. He published some papers, described some animals. Um, but what he really was was a field paleontologist. And so back in the 1800s, one of the common things that happened is you had paleontologists that would be back at museums largely along the East Coast in the US and New York and Washington DC and Philadelphia and places like that. And they would hire field crews to go out to the American West and basically find all the fossils that they could, box them up um, into rail cars and ship them back to the East Coast. Uh, where then um, preparators and paleontologists back there would open them up, see what they'd found, um, describe them, and put them on display. And this is because there was kind of a museum rush going on at this time, where all the big museums on the East Coast wanted to have the newest dinosaur and the biggest dinosaur, and they all wanted to beat out the other ones and have that dinosaur first. So John Bell Hatcher was one of these guys that did a lot of exploring out in the Western U.S. and, and discovered a lot of important dinosaurs. And back in 1891, he was down in a little town uh, called Lance, Wyoming, and found a little dinosaur skeleton, which he um, boxed up and then sent back to Othniel C. Marsh, um, one of the famous members of the Bone Wars. So you had Othniel Marsh and you had Cope as his competitor. And Marsh, um, was hanging out mostly around uh, the Yale Museum at this time, uh, but was also the head paleontologist for the United States Geological Survey. Um, so any of the fossils that were being collected by the government in the Western US and being sent back were going to Marsh's collection. And included in that was some of this material that John Bale Hatcher was collecting. Now, so much material was coming back that Marsh and his group of uh, preparators and paleontologists couldn't possibly get through all of it. They couldn't open every crate. They couldn't look at every discovery. And like I said, at this time, they were looking for the biggest, most exciting dinosaurs. And so when relatively small dinosaur skeletons came back, they kind of got put on a lower priority. Um, and I like to use um, this image here as a good example of what ended up happening to that little dinosaur skeleton that John Bell Hatcher collected. Um, it quite literally got put into a basement, still in its crate and locked away and ignored for a couple decades uh, while other um, specimens were, were examined. Now, um, <clears throat> Marsh did not live too much longer. He died in the late 1800s. 
and after he passed away, a good portion of his collection eventually was sent to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, and the Smithsonian Institute in 1903 hired this gentleman. At that time, he was much younger looking, but I like old cranky Charles W. Gilmore picture better. Um, Charles W. Gilmore was hired at the Smithsonian to work specifically on the Marsh collection and to then collect some of his own fossils and do a lot of um, descriptions of animals. And Charles Gilmore um, did a lot of the early work on dinosaurs from North America. And around 1912, 1913, he finally got his crew around to opening up the crate that contained the small dinosaur skeleton that John Bell Hatcher had sent back from Wyoming. And as soon as they opened it and started working into the plaster jacket, they just uncovered a few bones. And just from seeing the first few bones, he was surprised to figure out this is a dinosaur that as far as he was concerned was unlike any dinosaur we'd ever seen. Just a few bones he'd seen told him this is something new and needs to be described. And so um, what he did was very quickly in 1913, he figured the first couple bones that they had found coming out of that jacket, so they had part of an arm, so this is the arm down to the hand here. Here's a close-up of the foot and then a more extended view of the foot going up in the leg. They had a vertebra that they figured and a shoulder blade. And the rest of the specimen was still being cleaned up. It's still covered in rock, but he was so excited by this discovery that he figured these few bones they had and named this new species. Uh, based on these bones. And what he named this species was Thesclosaurus. And there's different ways of saying this, like we've talked about in some of our um, other chats. We're really not certain what all the proper pronunciation is because we're dealing with a dead language. Some people say Thesclosaurus. I say Thesclosaurus. It's all fine. We're all talking about the same animal. But Thesclosaurus translated means the marvelous lizard. And this was because he thought this was a very wonderful discovery of a unique animal that they hadn't seen the likes of before. Um, that was the genus name. So if you're thinking of something like Tyrannosaurus rex, this would be equivalent with Tyrannosaurus. So then it needs a species name. And the species name then was Neglectus. So that makes this the neglected marvelous lizard because this dinosaur sat for so many years in this basement waiting to be opened up and discovered. And so Thesclosaurus is the neglected marvelous lizard, which I completely agree with. It's a perfect name for this animal. So as they continued working and cleaning up that specimen, eventually what they ended up with um, was this almost complete skeleton here. And so this is from a follow-up publication that Gilmore did in 1915, two years later, showing the full specimen and then giving a better description of all the material that they had. And so Here's that first hand that he figured, um, the first foot that they figured, and then you know, they had some vertebrae from up near the neck area. Um, but then in this publication, they were able to describe most of the rest of the skeleton here. But what you will notice, the problem is, is there's a very prominent place where this specimen just ends. And it's right here at the base of the neck. So they had an almost complete specimen. And if you ask any paleontologist, and I, hopefully Becky will agree, if we went out and we found this much of a dinosaur skeleton, we would be super excited and happy of any type of dinosaur. This is a lot of a single individual dinosaur, but it's missing the part you'd really, really like to have, which is the head. And this became a problem because especially in early paleontology, one of the ways that we best described and compared dinosaurs was based on what the skull looked like because there's a lot of variation that happens in the skull. Um, and so, the back of this animal, what we call the postcranium, was different enough that they could tell this is a new animal, we can name this. Um, but the lack of a skull would cause problems for years to come with trying to figure out exactly what this animal was. So in the 1915 publication, Gilmore decided to fix this problem by looking at an animal that he thought was somewhat closely related, which was Camptosaurus. Um, and Camptosaurus is um, another ornithischian or plant-eating dinosaur. It's somewhat close on the evolutionary tree to Thesclosaurus. It's another bipedal dinosaur walked on its back two legs. Um, and the head at that time was reconstructed roughly like this. And so this is a figure from about the same time period. And you can see that this figure here for Thesclosaurus, that's from Gilmore's paper, 
he literally took the exact same skull and just flipped it around and put it onto Thesclosaurus. I mean, zoom in on this thing. That is the same drawing. He just flipped it over and put it onto Thesclosaurus because it was the best they had at that time. Um, it's an animal somewhat like Camptosaurus. Let's put a Camptosaurus skull on it. There's never been any problems in dinosaur paleontology with just throwing a skull on a dinosaur and pretending that's the real skull. We've never had any issues with that before. So um, the next thing that they did, which breaks my heart and thankfully has been fixed in the new Smithsonian exhibit, but they decided we need to get this thing on display, but it's also a small dinosaur. It would be easy for people to mess with this skeleton or steal parts of the skeleton. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna embed this thing into the wall, directly plaster it into the wall. So that's what you're seeing. These are the real bones, this is not a cast. So there's the tail running up to the hips, to the back legs, to the front legs, and then they faked the neck and put a fake skull on to the front, but then they stuck it in the wall. And what you can also see here is, this is the ceiling corner up here. So this is the ceiling and this is the wall. And these, if you've ever been to the Smithsonian Museum, these are really high ceilings. These are like 12 or 14 foot ceilings where this specimen is at. So it's like 12 feet off the ground, stuck into the wall. And this is the original and for a while only specimen of Thesclosaurus. So for example, when I was doing my research on this animal, they had to, close off this little area with some ropes and then set up this big ladder so I could climb up and then stand on a ladder while trying to take notes and take photographs of this specimen it was not an ideal solution. So thankfully that's been fixed now. Um, and if you go see the newly opened exhibits at the Smithsonian, you can see this remounted skeleton. It's actually a beautiful little specimen. We'll see it a little bit later. But you can see they had to just stick this skull on. Um, make up a skull and stick it on because that's what they did back then. They wanted the animals to look complete. And it turns out that uh, this skull, just like the Camptosaurus skull, was not accurate at all for what this animal would actually look like. Um, some authors also eventually reconstructed the skull to look like a dinosaur called Hypsilophodon, which again is an animal somewhat closely related to Thesclosaurus. Um, this one is found um, in England. It has this very short boxy skull, so keep that in mind because we're going to talk about um, short boxy skulls here in a little bit. Um, but again, this is not quite accurate for Thesclosaurus as we're going to see. And it turned out, this is my slide to remind me to stop the screen sharing and go back to looking at me. <clears throat> so it turned out that it would take us a hundred years from the naming of Thesclosaurus originally in 1913, the first publication that had really good, well-described skull material for Thesclosaurus was published in 2014. So for almost a hundred years, we only had a very vague idea of what the skull of Thesclosaurus would look like. So we had that kind of weird Camptosaurus skull, we had that short boxy Hypsilophodon skull, people arguing back and forth, and it turned out eventually that what Thesclosaurus' skull looks like is this right here. So this is a cast, none of this is fake, all of this is cast from original bone. So this is what Thesclosaurus looks like. And you can see that the skull is much narrower and longer and drawn out than any of the previous reconstructions. And additionally, if I tip this up, it's also very narrow side to side. So it's this very narrow arrow-like skull, which is unlike most of the other dinosaurs it's closely related to. Um, doesn't have that short boxy skull. Um, it doesn't have that kind of bigger bulky skull like Camptosaurus. It has a very unique skull that makes it clearly different from every other species that's out there. So it also has a few other neat features um, that some other dinosaurs do, but a lot of people don't think about a lot. Um, the first is these bones across the top of the eye right here. Um, so you can see um, this is the eye socket right there, and there's this bone that comes out to here and then there's a second bone that starts here and comes across and if we look at that in top view we can see that it creates this gap on the top right so <clears throat> it's very loosely connected just set against the skull right here but it's not like fused up it would just be like a tendon that was holding it right here and the same with back over here um, and these bones are called supraorbitals and more than likely, what happened was there was a fleshy connection that covered this part right here over, 
and this would kind of sh give shade to the eye sockets right here. So that's interesting. We're not quite sure why they did this, but it's a really neat feature that we see in these, uh, this species and other closely related species. But if you get up to like your duck-billed dinosaurs or your you know, Ceratopsy and your horned dinosaurs, they don't have features like this. Um, just these little guys do. So that's a, a really neat feature of Thesplosaurus. Not every animal that has these bones do they come all the way across. Sometimes it's just a little spike that comes out and stops part way. Um, but Thesplosaurus has these big, broad connections across here. Um, another neat thing is it's hard to see on the cast, but this whole upper surface of the nose right here is all filled with little holes and pits and grooves, which suggests that this whole area in the front here was covered with like a horny beak-like covering. Um, so not just on the front, which we'll talk about in a bit, but that horny covering probably extended back up onto the skull a little bit, which is kind of neat um, for these animals. So now you remember I talked about that hypsilophodon skull, that short boxy skull. Almost every species that's closely related to Thesplosaurus has that short boxy skull. Thesplosaurus is different because it has this big elongate skull. But it turns out that if we look at a young Thesplosaurus specimen, and this is a young Thesplosaurus that is only about two thirds grown, so it's still older, but it's not a full adult you can see that this skull is shorter and boxier. So when Thesplosaurus is young, it has a typical short boxy skull. And then what happens as it grows is the, one of the last things that happens is this nose lengthens and shoots out and gets longer. Um, and so it kind of has like a Pinocchio effect going on. Apparently it told a lot of lies as it got older and its nose just went whoop and got really elongated. Um, <clears throat> and we can see so this is our best complete skull of Thesplosaurus for close to an adult individual. This is not quite a full adult, um, but this is an even bigger specimen here, which is actually kind of hard to see because it's so big. But all we have from this specimen, this is the nose right here. So this is part of the upper jaw coming across there, the lower jaw here. That's all we have. Nothing else was found, just this part. But this is much bigger than the other specimen. And if you take measurements of the front of the nose, the front of the nose is even more elongated. So it keeps elongating that nose as it gets bigger. Um, so it's almost developing this like pelican-like nose as it gets older. It's really kind of strange. <clears throat> so this allowed us to finally then figure out what Thesplosaurus was related to now that we had the skull and we could look at what was going on. And then we could also study the diet of this animal and what it was eating in more detail. And that's some of the stuff that I'm going to go into now. So if I can go back to share screen. So this is the new mount for the Smithsonian Museum. So that animal that I showed you that was stuck up on the wall before, this is what the mount looks like now. Um, so you can see they took the skull cast that I just showed you and put that skull on this animal. So it has an updated and correct skull now, this long drawn out skull. Um, but they also pulled it off and mounted it three dimensionally. So it looks more like a, an actual dinosaur now. Um, one thing you can note here is it's, it is bipedal. It walks on its back two legs. Um, the front legs are reduced in size a little bit and actually the hands are kind of reduced inside. It's got little short stubby figure, fingers, but they're not like, completely useless re reduced arms like Tyrannosaurus rex. They're not that small. They could still use them to grab stuff. They're just not walking on them um, in these animals. So um, they're also uh, not that big. Uh, the biggest animals that we've got good skeletons for are maybe about 14 feet long, which sounds really long, but they're only about, if they were standing up, um, they'd be looking eye level with an average sized adult. So they're not super tall. So for dinosaurs, it's a rather small dinosaur. It'd be a big animal to have around now, but dinosaur size is fairly small. Now, <clears throat> what it's lacking though, is any of the features that we see in most of our ornithischian dinosaurs. Most different groups of ornithischian dinosaurs have some really unique feature that sets them apart from other groups of ornithischian dinosaurs. So our horned dinosaurs have these big horns either over their eyes or on their nose or both. Um, and these big frills that come out and come back like that. Um, our pachycephalosaurs have their big dome heads with the big spikes all over their heads. Um, 
our duck-billed dinosaurs. We even get crested duck-billed dinosaurs, especially up to Parasaurolophus, which has the big elongate crest. This is Saurolophus with a little shorter crest. And then our armored dinosaurs, like our stegosaurs. This is a stegosaurian dinosaur here with the big plates and spikes going down the back. And of course, you have your ankylosaurs that are related to the stegosaurs, which are a big tank-like animal. Thesclosaurus doesn't have any of that going on. So what did Thesclosaurus look like? Well, it was rather plain, like I showed you, if I back up just a minute. Um, there's no big claws, there's no horns, there's no spikes, there's no frills. It's kind of a no-nonsense little dinosaur. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what did the outside of the animal look like? And this is a question that a lot of people ask now with the new discoveries we're having with dinosaurs. Did it have scales? Did it have feathers? Did it have both? Um, we don't have good evidence from Thesclosaurus itself. We don't have preserved skin from Thesclosaurus, but we can look at some closely related dinosaurs to try to interpret what Thesclosaurus might have looked like. So in several different groups of ornith ornithischian dinosaurs, we do see kind of these elongate kind of proto-feather type filament structures. So this is a very... Um, early ornithischian dinosaur, what's called a heterodontosaurid. Um, and it has these very long filament-like feathers coming off the, the base of the tail here. We also see that in some of our early horn dinosaurs. So this is Cetacosaurus from China. And if you look down on the base of the tail right here, this is a close-up. You can see these long filaments coming off there. Um, so there is some support for maybe some filamentous coverings um, especially on the tail in some of these smaller ornithischian dinosaurs. Um, but our best evidence of what Thesclosaurus might have looked like comes from a relatively recently discovered dinosaur from Russia. And this dinosaur is called Colindodromius. Um, I love this dinosaur. This is a great dinosaur specimen. Um, you should definitely look up Colindodromius and learn more about it because I'm not going to talk about it in sufficient detail to really understand it. But what's really great about the Colindodromius specimens is a lot of them preserve really great skin impressions um, that show us what was going on with the outside covering of this animal. So what you're looking at here in these images, this is um, one of the feet running through here. So this is a toe running out here. And you can kind of see this blotchy area here. Well, if we zoom in on that, you can see those are actually the scaly pads that went around the feet. So we know the back legs on these animals had these scaly coverings. And so this is a little higher up on the foot, kind of the flat part of the foot. And you can see that scaly skin that would have covered that area. And even moving further up onto the foot, so this is coming into the shin area right here. Once again, we can see scales preserved, but they're getting a little bit larger. And we see this as well in our Dakota the dinosaur mummy. As we move away from the feet and get up into areas that don't flex as much, we tend to get bigger scales. So the, the hind legs and the feet were scaly in this animal. But if we look at more into the body region, what we start seeing is there's this really interesting mix of these kind of scale-like plates that are present. So that's what you're seeing here is a scale-like plate, which is then surrounded by these kind of um, filamentous, almost bristly-like feathers. They're not like a full puffy downy feather or a full contour feather like we see in birds, but it definitely has this bristly covering kind of like we see um, in the other animals I showed you, the heterodontosaurids and the early ceratopsian dinosaurs. Um, so this is really unique and it covers the whole body area. So the rib cage, the stomach area, um, that whole area is covered with these little bristly feather-like structures um, over the whole body. And then, if we move to the tail, the tail is really cool and was something that I was not expecting. So what you're looking at here is this is the base of the tail. So the front of the animal is this way, the back of the animal is this way. Um, top is up here, bottom's down this way. And there are these big scale-like plates that are kind of armoring up the tail. So this is a more zoomed out view. And so this is those top plates that you were seeing right over here. And then there's another set of plates that run around the bottom and they basically enclose the whole tail in this kind of cone of protective scales. Now, these, this isn't full armor, so there's no bone component to this. This is not like, say, crocodiles that have all those bones embedded in the skin, um, or your ankylosaurs, your armored dinosaurs, which also have those bony plates in their skin. This is just a scale, so it's probably something that has the hardness of like fingernail, 
Um, but it is still pretty in large, thickened scales that gave a little bit of protection then to the tail area. So if we take all that evidence and reconstruct this animal, um, here's some of the reconstructions that have been put out. You get these adorable little dinosaurs, and this was a very, very small dinosaur, just a couple feet in size, um, that has this kind of feathery covering over the main part of the body, scaly legs and maybe scaly arms, and then this really interesting um, protected and scaled up tail extending out the back. Um, so this is an artist reconstruction of drawing here, and then this is kind of a 3D model that someone actually built and put together of what Calindodromius might have looked like. And Calindodromius um, is not in the same group with Thesclosaurus, but it's right outside of that group, and it's the closest animal to Thesclosaurus that we have good information on what the outer skin looked like. And so um, there's been attempts then to reconstruct Thesclosaurus with some of these similar features, the big plated scales on the tail, the scaly feet and up into the legs, and then these filamentous coverings, um, feathery coverings over the main part of the body. And so this may be something like what Thesclosaurus looked like. It's certainly just as valid of a hypothesis as say the whole animal being covered with scales. So hopefully eventually we'll find some specimens that have everything preserved on the outside and we can say for certain what Thesclosaurus looked like, but for right now, this is a pretty good guess about what's going on with Thesclosaurus. Um, and I like it, it's really unique. I think it's a, a great little uh, reconstruction. So that then leads us to the question of um, what did Thesclosaurus eat? This is one of these questions that we always get asked about any dinosaur that we're talking about. You know, what did it look like and what did it eat? Uh, was it a her herbivore? Was it mostly eating plants? Was it a carnivore? Was it mostly eating meat? Or was it an omnivore where it was eating a mix of the two? <clears throat> so to answer this question, we can look at what's going on with the teeth of this animal now that we finally have good, well-preserved skulls. So to review some terms for you really quick that we've kind of talked about before, but I don't know how well we've defined them in our chatting series. Um, there's two broad categories of tooth shape that get talked about a lot. Uh, the first is what we call homodont dentition, and that just means that for the most part, all the teeth have similar shape. So think of like a crocodile where most of the teeth pretty much look very similar to each other, um, and it's hard to tell a front tooth from a back tooth in most cases. That's called homodont dentition. Um, alternatively, you have heterodont dentition, where the teeth have all different shapes and sizes. So for example, mammals like us, all of our teeth, depending on where you're looking at in our mouth, our teeth are all shaped different. We have incisors and canines and premolars and molars. Um, you can see this nice kitty cat yawn right here. Um, and you can see all the different size and shapes of teeth in its mouth. That's a different type of um, um, tooth structure. Now, most dinosaurs get talked about as having homodont dentition. Pretty much their teeth look the same throughout their mouth. If you're talking about something like T-Rex, most of its teeth are big spiky um, puncture teeth <clears throat> with serrated edges for cutting. There's a little bit of difference from front to back, but for the most part, the teeth look the same. On our plant eaters, the same thing is happening where most of the teeth are being used for grinding and they look pretty much the same with very little variation in the tooth row. But there are some um, exceptions to this within dinosaurs, and Thesclosaurus is one of these exceptions. Thesclosaurus does not have homodont dentition, it has heterodont dentition. So it has different teeth in different parts of its mouth. <clears throat> so if we start with what we call the cheek teeth, so that's these teeth right in here, the teeth that like in our mouth where our molars would be, that we do most of our chewing with and grinding. Um, this area here is what we call the cheek teeth on this animal, and if we zoom in on those cheek teeth, what we see is they're these kind of broad triangular teeth that have these big ridges on the sides and then little bumps that stick up on the edges. These are called denticles. They're not serrations like you see in meat-eating teeth. Um, serrations are um, very low and they tend to have very um, pronounced corners, which makes them a little bit sharp and allows for cutting and tearing. These are very broadly rounded um, surfaces, and so these are called denticles, and they just help to increase the chewing surface. Um, <clears throat> and so a good comparison for these teeth <clears throat> is actually the teeth of an animal that we have around today, which is the iguana. So this is an iguana skull here, and if you zoom in on its teeth, you can see iguanas have these very triangular teeth that have these very pronounced 
little denticles running along the edges. Um, now there is some variation. There are different types of iguanas and some have very different teeth. But this iguana here has these teeth that are very similar to our Thesclosaurus teeth and iguanas are mostly plant eaters. And so this tells us that these teeth, these cheek teeth are mostly designed for processing plant material. However, <clears throat> if we move to the front of the mouth on the upper jaw here, this, is, this bone here is called the premaxilla. And if we look at the premaxillary teeth here, we can see that they're shaped very different from the teeth farther back in the skull. They're um, conical, so they're nice and round, and they're very pointed, and they're a little bit recurved at the tips. And they're rather similar to crocodilian teeth, these pointed teeth that are more for puncturing or grabbing and holding onto things and are not really meant for chewing plant material. So this is very different from the teeth in the back of the mouth. You don't really have much use to puncture and hold onto a plant because plants don't tend to struggle very much when you grab onto them. <clears throat> so this is not what we would expect in an animal that's just eating plants. Um, a third feature that's kind of unique for Thesclosaurus is it actually has a beak at the front of the mouth. And so it's very pronounced on the lower jaw here. So this is a bone right here called the predentary and there's no teeth in the predentary. It's flat on the upper surface, and this whole front part down here would be covered with a beak, like in a bird. So imagine this lower beak right here on this little guy. And then even though on the premaxilla, there's teeth <clears throat> in the premaxilla, the teeth stop right here. And this front part right here, um, there's very clear evidence that this front part was also covered by a little beak. So there's a broader beak on the lower part, but there is a little beak right here in the front and you can see the bones a little damaged, but it does hook down a little bit on the front. And if it was complete, we would have a nice little down hook here. So this beak would look kind of similar to this bird right here, where it would have a, a short, not a super pronounced, but short little down hook beak on the front. And beaks are really good for nipping and tearing at things. That could be plant material or it could be nipping little pieces of meat off of things. But Overall, Thesclosaurus has three uh, unique uh, features for feeding in its mouth. It's got a little beak at the front for nipping things off. It's got these um, pokey teeth right here in the front for puncturing or grabbing and holding onto things. And then it has these teeth at the back that are better suited for, for snipping and a little bit of processing um, of plant material. Now, it wasn't doing a ton of chewing, but it was maybe grinding stuff up a little bit in its mouth. And so what this tells us is that Thesclosaurus was probably an omnivore, and it was probably very opportunistic, which means it was eating whatever it could find. And so it was probably eating a lot of plant material because there's a lot of plant material around, but that, that nose and those teeth um, were probably very good at you know, grabbing and snapping up little lizards or frogs and things like that that were around. And they were especially good uh, potentially for um, that narrow pointed skull for kind of sticking its nose down into the ground and rooting out um, grubs and other insects and things like worms and maybe some uh, fleshy what we call tubers. So things like that we have today like carrots or potatoes or stuff like that. There were similar types of plants around then that it could have been uprooting these roots uh, to eat as well. And so it has a very unique dietary style that we don't see in a lot of other animals. Um, and what will be really interesting down the road is if there's more studies we can do to learn more about what portion of its diet was plants versus some of these other animals. Um, another thing that's very neat about Thesclosaurus that we can tell from the rest of the body is those little hands with the short little fingers. On the ends of them, they have little hoof-like claws, but those claws are curved in, so it's not like a sharp claw. Um, so they're not using them for fighting or scratching, but they're these curved hooves that are really well designed then for scooping and digging up dirt. And so this is maybe more evidence in support of them rooting around in the ground and finding insects and bugs and little roots and things like that to eat. So they seem to be very well suited to kind of live on um, anything, any little thing they could find around in the environment that a lot of other dinosaurs weren't spending as much time looking for. So back to this slide again, um, like I talked about, Thesclosaurus doesn't have all of these extreme features that we see in other groups of ornithischians, which means that it doesn't really 
fall into any one of these major ornithischian groups. It's not a pachycephalosaur. It's not a horned dinosaur or a ceratopsian. It's not a hadrosaur or a duck-billed dinosaur. And it's not one of our armored dinosaurs like our stegosaurs and our ankylosaurs. So what is Thespilosaurus related to? Well, we talked about in one of our previous um, chats about what we call wastebasket taxa, which is when we don't know where an animal goes, we make up a group and throw all the animals that we don't know where they go into that group until we can figure out where they would go. And Thesclosaurus for a while was in a group like that. But it turns out, as we've discovered more and more dinosaurs, that Thesclosaurus was grouped with a lot of these other small um, dinosaurs, plant-eating or omnivorous dinosaurs that walked mostly on two legs, this is our little buddy, Erictodromius, that we heard about um, a couple weeks ago, the burrowing dinosaur. It's very closely related to Erictodromius. Um, so you can see a similar outside feathery and scaly covering reconstructed here on, on Erictodromius. And it, as we learn more and more about dinosaurs, there's a whole group of these rather small bipedal dinosaurs that were maybe omnivores that have a lot of adaptations for either burrowing into the ground like Erichodromius, or digging around on the surface like Thesclosaurus. And so we now have enough evidence to realize that Thesclosaurus is actually part of its own group that's separate from all the other main groups of Ornithischian dinosaurs. And that's a group that we call the Thesclosauridae. So it has its own group named after it. And there's a whole range of species now that are referred to that group. We've got Erichodromius down here, this is Corianosaurus that comes from the Korean Peninsula. You can see it reconstructed here, scratching around at the ground, looking for food. Um, this animal was even more specially built for digging around than Thesclosaurus was. Um, and so Thesclosaurus in 1913, just from the few bones that Gilmore dug up, he immediately recognized that this was a unique animal. And it's taken us about 100 years to really fully understand how unique of a dinosaur Thesclosaurus is but it was our first real glimpse at this whole broad group of dinosaurs that we now know about called the Thesclosaurids that are kind of filling in the background in most of our Mesozoic landscapes. While other bigger, flashier dinosaurs are running around, these guys are there in the background doing really cool things um, that other dinosaurs aren't doing like burrowing and digging around and hunting for grubs and things like that. So I think that um, makes Thesclosaurus rather special um, and is kind of a unique discovery. Um, now, moving forward, we continue to have the same issues with Thesclosaurus. Uh, for whatever reason, we found more skeletons. We don't have a ton, but more and more skeletons. But we keep having situations like this where we get nice, beautiful skeletons. Here's the front arms up here, the rib cage running through here, the back legs coming here, a good portion of the tail, and there's no head again. Um, and so, for whatever reason, these dinosaurs um, enjoy being found without their heads on them. Luckily with this specimen, this is a, a specimen that's at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, there's a cast of this one now on display. This one, after they found the skeleton, they looked on the outer surface of the hill and they found a block of rock that had rolled down the hill. And within that block of rock, they found most of the skull in that block. So we do have then another skull from this one that was found, thankfully, because they did really good work making sure they found everything on the surface. Um, but we almost ran into another situation where we get just a skeleton and not the head. Um, so that's my overview of Thesclosaurus. I hope everyone agrees that it's a pretty cool little dinosaur. Um, I will end my presentation and I am happy to answer any questions people might have about Thesclosaurus. Well, first off, you skipped one of my favorite parts of Thesclosaurus. Um, can you talk about why the ribs are really cool? Yes. Let me, I actually have a copy of one of my publications here off to the side to be ready for this. So let me share my screen again. So there's another really unique feature. It's not just in Thesclosaurus, but we have a good record of this feature um, in Thesclosaurus. So it's a good animal to talk about it in. So this is a paper that um, a couple of my co-authors and I published back in 2011. And it is on these really interesting features called intercostal plates. Don't worry about that name. Um, remembering that name. But what it means is that this is a rib cage of um, a specimen of Thesclosaurus. So front is this way, back is this way, the top is here, the belly is down on this side. And you can see the ribs coming down and there's these big weird broad plates laying over the ribs here. 
And when this was first found, the thought was maybe this was skin preserved on the specimen. But as they cleaned it up, they realized that it wasn't skin because they overlap each other. That would be really weird, right, to have like these flaps of skin hanging off that overlap. Um, and it turns out these are actually made of bone. So they're not skin. They're some type of bony structure right next to the ribs of these animals and only right at the front. So this is the shoulder blade right here, the very back of the shoulder blade. So there's about six to seven of the first ribs have these plates associated with them. And then down in the belly area, these plates aren't present. And you can see on this cross section, here's a drawing showing how these plates overlap each other. So this is a rib and then a plate and then a rib and then a plate. So some hints of these were found in other dinosaurs, like that dinosaur I mentioned, Hippolophodon. Um, a couple South American dinosaurs like Talancowan and Macrogryposaurus have these. Um, but we weren't really sure what these features are. Now, in your um, avian dinosaurs and birds, they have a, like a kind of a strut that comes off of their ribs right here. It's just a straight little bony process that kind of curves back. And some of our meat-eating dinosaurs have these as well. They're called uncinate processes. And there's rib, uh, muscles that attach to those. And they're used to help the animals breathe. So the muscle pulls on that little hook that's on the rib and helps to pull open the chest cavity so that the animal can breathe in. And then when those muscles relax, it helps the animal breathe out. So it helps birds um, and some uh, non-bird dinosaurs, uh, like the raptors and things like that, have more efficient breathing. So that was one of the other suggestions is, well, maybe this is the same structure, but these don't look anything like those uncinate processes. They're, they're these big flat processes across here. And so what we did is, is um, we did what we've talked about a bit um, on these chats is we took some of these and we cut through them and made uh, histology slides so we could see what was going on. And I wanna show these just cause they're really pretty cause we did them in color. But this is a cross section through one of these plates and so the dark area, that's actually rock surrounding the plate still that hasn't been cleaned off. So uh, the bony material is the stuff that's really bright and shiny through here. And so this is the same image just under two different types of light. And what you're seeing in this image is that you've got some bone on the inside here, um, this kind of darker orange layered stuff. But then this really bubbly area that's kind of a brighter orange and really glows um, kind of a bluish white under this light um, that still has that bubbly texture, that's calcified cartilage. So it's not real bone, it's more like what you've got in your nose, a little more flexible. And what this is showing is that this plate was in the middle of turning from cartilage to bone. So that's the step in between. Um, calcified cartilage is a step in between when you take a soft cartilage and then you add a little bit of harder support to it, makes it calcified cartilage, and then eventually um, little cells come through and eat away at that calcified cartilage and replace it with bone. And so this showed us that this plate was still in the middle of forming. And there's some really great pictures here. You can see every one of these little bubbles is where an individual little cell would be in, inside that calcified cartilage, uh, which is really um, interesting. But anyways, what this showed us is that um, if we go down, there's very clear evidence. Uh, when we had Holly Woodward that talked, she talked about fibers in the bones and that if you've got like a tendon or something attached to a bone in a place that's really pulling and putting a lot of stress on that bone, you'll get these fibers preserved in that bone that gives you evidence that there was a, a muscle or tendon attachment there. And we see on the only on the outer surface of these plates, this really dense layering of these fibers. And this tells us that these plates weren't in the skin. So they weren't armor plates up in the skin. They were plates that were down deep inside the muscle and actually had muscles attached to them. And so we're not quite sure uh, what these plates were doing. We haven't found enough of them to know exactly what the function was, but because they overlap like this, they seem like they would do a very good job of giving support to the rib cage. So if something hit it from the outside, that overlapping plate-like structure would distribute that force. And so maybe this is some sort of protection on the outside, or maybe um, it's some sort of adaptation um, for some reason to help give extra support to the rib cage. Um, why it would need that extra support, we're not certain, but they have these really funky features 
that we only see in a couple species of dinosaurs that we're still trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so there's more work that we're trying to do on, the, on these from other specimens, and I'm really interested to see what they're doing. But right now, we know enough to know that they're not uncinate processes like we see in birds. They're probably not being used to help with breathing. They're maybe being used for some type of defensive feature, um, but it's a really cool structure that makes these animals really unique. Okay, Clint, I need you to take off your headphones temporarily. Close your ears. Okay, everybody, I actually do like Thessalosaurus. You just can't tell Clint. Bring it back? Yep, you're good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so our questions as we're going through here. Um, how many different types of Thessalosaurus are there in North Dakota? Uh, in North Dakota, we have one species that we know of, just Thessalosaurus neglectus, the, the first Thessalosaurus that was found. Um, in Montana, there is a single specimen that is referred to a different species called Thessalosaurus garbini, um, or garbinii. Um, and it is unique because it has a different ankle structure, which I won't get into, but there is some question about whether that ankle structure is real or if the specimen is just a little bit deformed. Um, and so it's actually a specimen of Thessalosaurus neglectus that just has a weird ankle. The problem is it's a really incomplete specimen. So for right now, it's recognized as a different species and maybe down the road, we'll either find more specimens that shows that yes, it is a different species or that show no, it, it's actually just Thessalosaurus neglectus. Now there is a third species that is found up in Canada, uh, mostly in Saskatchewan from a group of rocks called the Frenchman Formation, which is roughly the same age as the Hell Creek Formation down here. But there's a slightly different species of Thessalosaurus called uh, Thescosaurus assiniboensis that um, I helped name along with um, a few other paleontologists up there. Uh, the lead researcher was Caleb Brown, who now works at the Royal Terrell Museum. And Caleb did a really great job for his, his master's thesis uh, describing up that, that uh, species in Canada. And that one we've got pretty good material from, and there are some differences in the skull, especially in the brain case area in the back of the skull, if you look at my diagram. Back in this area of the skull, there's some different structure back here in Thescosaurus assiniboensis um, that makes it um, close enough that we put them in the same genus. They're both Thescosaurus, but different enough that you can tell the two apart very clearly. Um, so that's the three currently recognized species of Thescosaurus. Only Thescosaurus neglectus right now is known from North Dakota. I let them know that you helped out with the Thessalosaurus in Saurian. Uh, and now they're curious to see uh, how many other things did you get to help out with? In Saurian? Yeah. Or uh, just the Thessalosaurus. I just gave a little bit of feedback on the Thessalosaurus. Um, and then I think we shared a little bit of uh, imagery from Dakota as well to help with um, some of the um, skin patterning and stuff like that. Um, but they had some other sources as well for, for the Edmontosaurus reconstruction. So. Um, yeah, I helped out a little bit um, just to um, get some of the anatomy right. Um, I wouldn't say that I was a giant contributor, though, but it was fun. So modest. Um, so and then modest. also in Saurian, um, there is a non-playable character, which is a mosasaur that lives um, in, the, in the ocean right offshore. And if your character wanders too far out, swims out into the water, the mosasaur will potentially come and eat you. Um, they added that mosasaur. Um, because they should be around, um, but now we do have a specimen from North Dakota from the Hell Creek Formation of a mosasaur that shows that yes, mosasaurs were around, and the size of the mosasaur in that game, a big mosasaur like Mosasaurus um, uh, missouriensis, um, is the right size for the mosasaur that's around at that time. So we do have a specimen that was not used to make the mosasaur in that game, but after the fact gave support for the mosasaur being in that. So j just to clarify, so we're talking about a mosasaur that's like 40 to 50 feet long, not your Jurassic World creature that's like 150 feet. Yeah. So slightly different there. It's still big it's for a, a mosasaur. A real big size. A real mosasaur. big, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So being that you also have birds at home and whatnot, and you've heard plenty of various other reptiles, do you know what kind of sounds it might have made? We don't know too much about what sounds it made. Um, we actually do um, in, in this specimen here. It's not on this cast, um, but let me see. Yeah, so this specimen, um, I can't take it off the base, 
um, but has a lot of the really fragile features of the skull preserved. And so down inside here, um, you can kind of see this little rod shaped bone right here. That's actually the inner ear bone, the stapes. Um, so we can actually learn a lot about the ear of this animal because that's uh, preserved in place. And the specimen, when you look at the full specimen, not just the skull, there is these little curved rod shaped bones called the hyoid bones that are still in place. Um, those are the bones that support the tongue. And so we do have some of that kind of neck area bony material preserved. Now, there was no material in the neck area for like a syrinx, which is what birds use um, to make noises. Um, those are sometimes made of bones, a lot of times made of cartilage, sometimes calcified cartilage. If it was, if something like that was present and was made of calcified cartilage or bone, it should have been there on this specimen. But we didn't see anything like that in this animal. Um, it doesn't have, like we talked about with some of the hadrosaurs, it doesn't have like the big looping nasal passages that would make kind of the deep, low honking noises. Um, the, the sinus passages kind of pass just straight through on this animal. It's got big concavities up in here. This is pretty much, this area is completely hollow up in here for the sinuses, um, but there's no structure inside there. And so we don't have any really good evidence about what these animals would have sounded like. So probably any noise um, that something like a modern um, crocodile or alligator makes, which they can make some kind of chirping and hissing noises and things like that, is about as accurate as we can get for these animals. There's no evidence of like a really well-developed um, uh, call system in these animals, right now at least. Uh, with the, the short arms, do you think uh, that Thessalosaur was also a digger? I do think Thessalosaurus was a digger. Um, there, there's been some, I'll bring this back down again. So one kind of subfield of paleontology is called biomechanics. And what they'll do is they'll look at bones and then they'll use computer models that are based off of a lot of what we see in modern animals and even just in engineering to then look at where um, forces and stress would be distributed through an animal and how they could potentially use their body. So like, can they do this or would it be too much stress and it would break something on them? Or what is the most efficient means of using this other feature? Um, when this has been done on the skulls of very similar animals to Thesclosaurus, what they found is that this long drawn out skull um, is kind of unique, but what's neat is that this premaxilla has this process that comes back right here. And this premaxilla actually overlaps up onto the nasal with these thin little struts way up onto here, which is really unique. In some, some closely related dinosaurs, this is open right here and doesn't connect at all. And in other ones, it just overlaps a little bit. In the Thesclosaurus, there's this big, broad overlap. And what they showed with the biomechanics is having that configuration with the long skull and this big overlap is really good for dealing with high points of stress up here at the tip of the nose right where this beak area is at. So it says that they were really good at snipping with this beak or gripping with these, these puncture teeth in the front. And I think part of the reason for that could be for like I was talking about, digging their snout down into the ground kind of like a pig does and rooting around and finding something down in there and then grabbing on real tight and pulling out whatever that might be if that's like a, 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 a root, like a carrot or something like that. Obviously we didn't have carrots in the Cretaceous, but that's just an example of something like that. Or grabbing, you know, grubs or worms or something like that and pulling them out. They're really well adapted for using this front part um, of the nose to grab onto things. And then if you look at these pointed teeth, what, what the wear on these shows is that when they're um, kind of a little bit younger, they kind of pound these teeth off flat. So this lower jaw here that has this broader beak has a flat area on the top. So kind of like a platform. And these teeth were coming straight down on that platform. So it would work kind of like a vise where it could pin things against there to hold on to them. Um, so it's a very efficient means of grabbing on and holding on to things in the front of the mouth. Um, and like I talked about those hands, they've got these little stubby fingers and the hand is not very big, but the arm bones, so the bones in the forearm 
and the upper arm bone are very bulky bones. So they're, they can take a lot of stress. And so these short little fingers um, with the curved claws on their hands would be very good for kind of getting in there and stirring up the upper surface of the ground. Now, um, Erictodromius and animals like that have similar features, but they're also much smaller. You're talking about an animal that's maybe, you know, different species, but between three and six feet in length, whereas Thusclosaurus is very different from its closely related species. It's like 14 feet in length. We have specimens that suggest that there were specimens or individuals up to about 20 feet in length. That's way too big to be digging holes in the ground. You think about like a 20 foot animal going around and digging burrows into the ground, that would leave a lot of evidence. And we don't have any evidence of that right now in the Hell Creek. We don't see big burrows that Thesclosaurus would have been going into. So more than likely, it was using those similar adaptations to stir around at the upper surface um, of the earth and look for food items and things like that. Or they that's were what I following think going on proper procedures and reclaiming the area after they got done digging. <laughs> Right now you're going to have me design like a badger saurus. Oh, badger! <laughs> oh dear. Can you talk a little bit more about the mosasaur that was found in the Hell Creek Formation? Where was it found and how can we tell what it is? So um, North Dakota, um, the central part of North Dakota, actually right here near Bismarck, um, is kind of the very eastern end of how far the Hell Creek Formation goes. This is right about where the shoreline would have been um, at the time of the end of the age of dinosaurs. So we're very close to the ocean here. So the dinosaurs and other animals we get preserved, we're living very close to the seaside. And any time that sea level varied just a little bit because we're so close to the shoreline, that would cause um, the, the, the sea to come up over this area and then retreat back out again. And so one of the last times that happened, um, there was a group of rocks laid down in North Dakota that is part of the Hell Creek Formation, but when we have formations, sometimes we break those up into smaller names because there's very unique things about them. And one of those um, subdivisions, which we call a member, one of these members is called the Breen member, and it's only found here in North Dakota. And that Breen member is one of those last times that the Seaway got a little higher and flooded into this area and laid down kind of like a beach type, type deposit, very near shore, very sandy, and put down anywhere from two or three to up to about 10 or 12 feet of rock, mostly sands and clays, and then sea level went down again and we got our, our regular Hell Creek with dinosaurs in it again. And south of town here at one of our dig sites that we work at, uh, this green member is present. And the landowner that we work with down there, it's a private land uh, section, uh, one day called us up and said, um, hey, I found a dinosaur bone. I'm going to bring it in to show you guys because he goes out and patrols his, his rocks when we're not out there digging to let us know if anything new comes out. That way, if something new is coming out, we can go and dig on it right away and not lose a bunch of it. And so we're like, oh, he probably just found, you know, another Edmontosaurus bone because at that site, especially, we have a lot of Edmontosaurus or maybe it's Triceratops, something like that. Because he said it was a good sized vertebra. It wasn't like a, like Thesclosaurus, we'd be looking at a vertebra like that. You can kind of toss it in your hand. Um, that would be pretty small. So he comes in and he's got it in a bag and he takes it out and he puts it into one of our hands. And the moment he puts it down, we can see it's a Mosasaur vertebra. Mosasaur vertebrae are very different from dinosaur vertebrae. And so we were like, where did this come from? Because we just weren't expecting it. Well, it turns out it came from another part of his property that we hadn't been to yet. And we hadn't realized that some of these green rocks are exposed over there. So he took us out to there and we found where this vertebra had been sitting on the surface. And it, there's a hillside and it weathered out and then kind of rolled down the surface. And so we had to try to figure out where it came from up there. And if, if it was just that vertebra, we may never have figured out where it came from. So we followed the hill back up. It's not very tall. It's maybe 20 something feet tall total. Um, and we found that the very top part of that hill is made up of the Breen member. And so once we got up there, we found a shark's tooth, which was really cool. Um, and then looked around and there's some of our shrimp burrows, Ophiomorpha are there. So we're definitely in 
um, ocean sediments here, definitely the brine member. And then working around a little bit more, we found some little scraps of bone on the surface, but it wasn't directly where this mosasaur uh, vertebra was found. It was over maybe 30 feet or so. Um, so it wasn't right where this vertebra had come from more than likely, but we followed those fragments up and we dug in and what we found was one of the lower jaw bones. Um, unfortunately, not one of the ones that has teeth, um, mosasaurs, they have um, bones more to the front of their jaw, a bone called a dentary that has the teeth in it. And then they've got a whole bunch of bones that make up the back part of the jaw that we don't have um, that uh, are separate. And so one of these bones is called the prearticular. And it was this prearticular bone, the bone that kind of forms this part down here of their lower jaw. And so again, this is a bone that when you find it, it doesn't look like any other animal's prearticular. It's very clearly a mosasaur prearticular. So we collected that, and what's probably happening, the deposit that it's in, it looks like it was kind of a stable surface for a while. And so this mosasaur probably died on this surface and rotted till all the flesh was gone, and then the bones kind of got spread out. So it's not laying there um, like a nice articulated animal. Um, what we have is that every now and then a random bone will pop out here or there that goes to this individual, but we can't, like for example, where we found this lower jaw bone, we dug in a bunch more and found nothing more because the bones are really spread out. So every couple of years we go back and we recheck the spot just to look to see if anything more is coming out. Maybe in the future we'll do more of an organized dig there to try and see if we can find more of it. But for right now we've got that jaw bone and we've got that vertebra. But what's nice is that that jawbone is actually um, has some characters on it, some features that are very unique to a certain type of mosasaur called Mosasaurus. So we can tell this is Mosasaurus. And then the vertebra is from kind of um, right in what would be our hip area. And so that's kind of the area of the body on a Mosasaur where you get some of the biggest vertebrae. And so that vertebra then is really good for estimating how big this animal was, because we can compare it to more complete specimens and say, okay, it's a little bit bigger than this specimen, which is this long, and it's a little bit smaller than this specimen, which is this long. So it turns out this was a pretty good sized Mosasaur, probably in the, the upper 20 feet to maybe lower 30 feet level, which is a pretty good sized Mosasaur. Certainly isn't one I'd want to tangle with in real life. Um, so even though we've only got two bones from it so far, they kind of are the two bones we'd really need to know um, to make sure that we're dealing with a mosasaur and about which mosasaur we're dealing with. So that's been really exciting. We're working on writing up a paper on that right now. Um, unfortunately, all this virus stuff has kind of messed that up. We were getting kind of close on it, um, but we haven't been able to finish it yet. So hopefully you'll see something more on that soon. One of the, before everybody starts getting excited about uh, a new dig site to work on, uh, beware when you're dealing with marine sediments, you're not talking about a nice concentrated area. If you've ever been out to the Pemina Gorge area, you'll understand that you can be digging for days and days at a time and just not run across anything. I mean, the ocean is a really, really big thing. And so if you have things that are dying on the bottom of the ocean, they're spreading out and you get more dirt on top of them. I mean, they could be anywhere. You could hit a hot spot, and there's a ton of stuff, or you could just have dry fishing, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with the river section, like on the other side of the property that we're working, which has a huge concentration of dinosaur bones, it has Edmontosaurus and Triceratops and some crocodiles, some turtle bits, I mean, it's, it's chock full of stuff because it's in a concentrated like river oxbow type channel. So everything is squished into one small location. And so there's a difference between your, your two different types of, of waterway deposits in there. So don't get too excited yet. <laughs> we'll wait till things really start popping out of the ground before we jump on that. <laughs> yeah, if we did a dig there, it would probably be more of like the three paleontologists and maybe some of our more committed volunteers that won't get discouraged right away um, because you're probably going to do a lot of digging without much discovery. Um, but because the specimen is so significant, anything that we did find would be really useful. So it's kind of worth that effort, if we do it. <laughs> <laughs> if we do it. Because <laughs> even I'm kind of like, oh, that's a lot of <laughs> I know, I'm just bucks. like, oh man. <laughs> Working our way back up the site faction is still just to find where the things are popping out. Ah, oh, nine days of digging, finally on the last day, finally back up at the top, okay, done with the dig. <sighs> Start over the next year, a little faster though. <laughs> Yeah, takes takes a lot of time. 
All right, uh, that is the the end of our lineup of questions in there. Oh, come on, no more questions about this wonderful little dinosaur. <laughs> now all I can think of is a little badger saurus. That's how I always took them, this little badger going around. I'm imagining him in the background, like while other things are happening, and he's just back there like Dirt pulling flying. out this like, slimy worm and sucking it down while he's watching what all the bigger dinosaurs are doing. So I think uh -huh. in a lot of these documentaries, um, these Thesclosaurus and similar animals um, could make really good background characters. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right, so I think that's it. Okay, well, uh, thank you everybody for, for coming to another Chatting with NDGS Paleo. And again, this Thursday at 10 a.m. Central, we'll be chatting with Renee Hernandez Riviera, who, who's gonna be talking um, about dinosaurs from Mexico. And yeah, he's, he's really fun. He's really fun. <laughs> Almost as fun as Glenn. <laughs> So if, uh, <clears throat> if anybody has any additional questions about Thesclosaurus or anything else we've been talking about, remember we have the Discord server where um, people can post questions and chat with us. So um, I've been a little absent from there lately, but I will open that up after we're done with this talk here today. Um, so we'll be there if people want to chat about anything. So thanks for joining us to hear about one of the lesser known dinosaurs from the Hell Creek. You just want to use your emoji again. I do want to use my emojis. <laughs> Becky made me a Thesclosaurus emoji, so um, I have to use it constantly now. Totally. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful day. We'll see you later. See you, everyone.